So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making 
itong bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published, all at the same time. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. 
Biayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second virtual forum of the SERP-P Knowledge Sharing Webinar Series. I'm Sheila Sior. I lead a knowledge dissemination program of PIDS, which includes the Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, or SERP-P. In recognition of our young people as an important resource for development, and in support of International Youth Day on August 12, we have chosen Capacitating and Investing in the Youth for a Productive and Resilient Future as the theme of our second webinar. To unpack this theme, we will have presentations from our CERP partner institutions on various aspects concerning the youth. In the course of our conversation, we hope to identify ways forward to more effectively capacitate and empower our young people to become active, productive, and resilient citizens. So officially open our virtual event and give us more information about CERP and today's forum. Let us listen to Dr. Anisette Orbeta Jr., the president of PIDS.
Sir, Dr. Ebeta, you now have the floor. Dr. Ebeta. I think uh, Dr. Ebeta is having a problem uh, regarding his internet um, connectivity. So at this point, um, before we hear from Dr. Arbeta, allow me to remind you of our guidelines uh, to join the discussion later. So uh, you may post your questions and comments using the Q&A uh, button. And uh, please indicate your name and organization if you'd like to be identified when I read out the questions. And then to all our presenters, you may respond by typing your answers which will be visible to all our attendees. And alternatively, you can choose to answer the questions live during the open forum. And for our uh, live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. So please use the comment section on Facebook for your questions, and we will accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. Okay, uh, at this point, may I go back to Dr. Arbeta? Okay. Um, Thea, can you hear me? Uh, Ma'am Sheila, uh, Miss Nina is currently contacting um, Dr. Urbeta. Po. Okay. Um, okay. So let us proceed to the presentations and we will just hear later from uh, Dr. Urbeta. Um, okay. So... We can now uh, proceed to uh, our uh, first uh, presenter, okay? So we have, okay, Dr. Orbeta is back, sir. No, okay. Sheila, we can proceed with the, the presentation. Yes, let us proceed to the presentations. Uh, since we have uh, a jam packed program, let us start the ball rolling. Our first presenter is Dr. Francisco Magno, who will talk about a study that he conducted uh, which assessed civic education programs for the youth. Dr. Magno is a professor of political science and development studies at De La Salle University, where he occupied various positions, including director of the De La Salle Institute of Governance, director of the Social Development Research Center, and chair of the political science department. He finished his PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii under an East-West Center Fellowship, and is currently the director of the uh, DLSU Civic Education Project under the Youth Leadership for Democracy program being implemented, implemented by the Asia Foundation with the support of USAID. Dr. Magna, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sheila CR. So I've asked uh, Seki to help me in the presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, so I will be presenting the preliminary findings from a project. Uh, it's a civic education project that is part of uh, Youth Leadership for Democracy or Youth Led, uh, which is a big program. It's a five year program. So we are part of uh, component three on civic education. And among the partners are the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Business for Education. So uh, what I'll be presenting would be the uh, project component that's part of, uh, that's being uh, conducted by De La Salle University. Uh, Youth-led is uh, in, being implemented by the Asia Foundation with the support of USAID. So let, let us proceed to the next slide. So just to share with you, uh, the objectives of this project uh, is to review and enhance the civic education curriculum in private schools and non-formal education programs in NGOs. So as I mentioned, uh, we are focused on examining uh, the programs, civic education programs of private schools and the private sector, as well as the non-government organizations. Uh, the University of the Philippines is the one examining the uh, curriculum modules of the public schools. Of course, the private schools are also following the uh, 
the standards set by the Department of Education, but they have uh, more leeway in terms of uh, introducing uh, content areas and even in terms of the methodology. The second key objective is to contribute towards enhancing or improving awareness, knowledge, and action regarding civic rights, duties, and responsibilities among the youth through research and crafting new modules for junior high school, senior high school, and NGOs. Next slide. So this is the methodology. So uh, I, I'm presenting to you the, the research results, the preliminary results that will inform uh, module development. And these are the methods. We conducted key informant interviews. We conducted document collection and rapid inventory. We gathered data on a program, uh, program background, training effects of civic education, strengths and gaps. Uh, the, these are from the the insights shared by our key informant interviews. So they include the administrators of uh, private schools, NGO leaders, and also uh, coordinators of the uh, junior and senior high school programs. So in terms of documents collected, we gathered uh, course and program outlines, curriculum maps, and syllabi learning modules and assessment tools. The rapid inventory consisted of uh, 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 asking for data on training, content, focus sectors, medium and mode of in instruction, youth education programs, and co-curricular activities. So we, we use uh, NVivo software in terms of uh, the qualitative content analysis. Next slide. So just to provide you with the, the project timeline. So uh, we, we've been doing this project for the past uh, nine months. So uh, we, we conducted data collection and developed partnerships. Uh, we've been uh, talking with various education uh, organizations, including the SEAP, uh, Catholic Educators Association of the Philippines, uh, the PAYAC or the Philippine Educational Assistance Committee, and the PACU or the Private Association of Colleges and Universities. We've also been uh, developing partnerships with uh, individual high uh, educational institutions that offer senior high school, including uh, Bicol University. So. So we actually inked that partnership with uh, with Bicol University. And, and so uh, we conducted this uh, preliminary analysis that I will share with you this morning. And uh, our, our module and curriculum specialist, uh, Ley Castillo, who is from De La Salle, Santiago Sabel, uh, developed a draft uh, module. In fact, she developed three modules, one for junior high school, for senior high school, and NGOs. So we'll also be doing uh, uh, teacher training. Uh, we had a data validation activity last week, and we will proceed with module implementation and monitoring and evaluation. Next slide. So this uh, is the coverage in terms of the regions. So. Uh, I mentioned rapid inventory, so we went to uh, different regions. Uh, of course, we were hampered uh, by uh, protocols, health protocols, so we conducted it through Zoom. And so these are the regions that we covered. Uh, we, we had uh, more than 100, uh, 100 uh, partner uh, institutions, including private schools and NGOs. Next slide. Okay, let me now show you the results of the, our examination of the private school curriculum. Next slide. 
So social studies uh, within the ecosystem of civic education in the K-12 curriculum is primarily located in the social studies learning domain. Although it does not preclude uh, the inclusion of civic education in the other subjects. So this is something that we are actually discussing, like some of the examples perhaps in mathematics can include content from the social studies as well as the other learning areas. Uh, but uh, what we found out that primarily social studies is the key subject area where civic education is incorporated. Next slide. So if we take a look at the different grade levels from K to 12, there, there is content that is available at the various grade levels. So for me, this is very interesting since I, of course, I, 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 I went to, I, I got my basic education a long time ago and uh, look at the, the titles of these uh, uh, civic education areas. From in kinder, you have myself and others. So it's a learning period where the individual, uh, the individual Filipino is learning to connect himself or herself with others. So he or she is not alone in this world in terms of exercising rights as well as performing responsibilities. So grade one, myself, my school, and family. So the sphere of uh, relationship is, is growing. And in grade two, you really have a broader sense. Of course, that's the competence or competency that is uh, pursued my community uh, now and then. So it's even a sense of uh, history of the local community. On, in grade three, you have now a concept of a region, belonging to a region, the Philippine regions. Understanding the different Philippine regions, of course. Uh, grade four, the Philippines as a country. So you now begin to have a sense of uh, being, uh, being part of a country and a nation. So there is a cultural sense there of identity. In grade five, the formation of the Philippines as a state. So belo you belong now to a political community. So you are now uh, developing this concept of a citizen belonging to a state and a state as part of a bigger community. And now you begin in grade six to connect the state with the nation. So the state as a political entity, uh, that collects taxes and that uh, uh, formulates and implements uh, laws and policies. But then you are part of a cultural entity called the nation. So that, therefore, the formation of concept of a nation state. And then the nation state, the Philippine nation state is part of Asia. In Southeast Asia, grade 7, Asian studies. And Asia belongs to the world or is part of the world. So the developments of our country is part of world history. And grade nine, uh, of course, we, we understand the globe, we understand globalization, and we should understand economics, market development. And so with grade 10, you all have these notions of identity, whether political, cultural, economic, uh, you belong to a country, to a state. You are a citizen of the world and the earth. And so in grade 10, 11, and 12, you begin to uh, bring together all these concepts and use these concepts in understanding contemporary issues. Grade 11, understanding culture, society, and politics. So those different sense of uh, identity, you begin to bring it together in a way that you can develop insights and you can analyze what's happening around you. In grade 12, Philippine politics and governance. And I suppose in grade 12, you are, you're, you're probably turning 18. 
and you can now vote in uh, depends of course on the electoral cycle and grade 12 community engagement next slide so civic education in junior high school uh, especially in contemporary issues so we can divide it into four grade levels uh, uh, grade phases or periods, grading, grading periods. In the first grading, you have environment and economy as content. Second grading, political and peace issues. Uh, third grading, human rights and gender. And fourth grading, civics and citizenship. Usually in civics and citizenship, we found out that what are tackled there is a combination of education issues and uh, citizenship issues. Next slide. In looking at the different uh, civic education modules used in private junior high schools, uh, as I mentioned, uh, private schools have more space in terms of introducing additional content areas. These are the things that we found out. The uh, focus, some of the focus areas are the role of citizenship in social change, uh, introduction of civic edu engagement models, the integration of Christian perspectives. Uh, as we know, private schools have, are, have uh, Christian uh, affiliations and community engagement framework uh, is there, as well as a number of schools linking their uh, content to SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the inclusion of human rights. In terms of the curricular modules, Private schools use diverse approaches, uh, including uh, case studies, simulation, uh, practical research, uh, poetry, video presentation, role playing, social media posts, analysis of policies and laws, and, the, and proposing civic and community activities. However, there are, all, there are some schools that do not have co-curricular activities. Next slide. Uh, okay, it's civic education in senior high school, in the senior high school core subject, which is understanding culture, society, and politics. This subject has eight subtopics. One responds to social, political, and cultural change that, that is divided into eight topics. And that amounts to eight hours. And uh, the topics that are included are inclusive citizenship and participatory governance, new forms of social media and social networking, social movements, including environmentalism, and feminism. So this, uh, this result indicates the lack of extensive civic education in the existing curriculum of senior high school in core subjects. As you notice, uh, it's only eight hours. So apparently in this subject area, understanding culture, society, and politics, there's more uh, discussion of the culture and societal part rather than uh, the political and citizenship part. Hence, if uh, senior high school students do not go to UMS, this would be their last exposure on civic education because under UMS, there is the Okay, we'll transition to the next slide. Okay, let's uh, look more closely at the division in terms of the number of R's in understanding culture, society, and politics. So you have Philippine politics and governance. Uh, first, uh, th this is taught in the first semester for 80 R's and community engagement, solidarity, and citizenship. Uh, 
also 80, 80 hours for second semester. So we noted that uh, in Philippine politics and governance, the focus is on politics and governance and not enough on citizenship. So only one thirteenth of the topics are primarily citizenship. And in the discussion on community engagement, solidarity, and citizenship, it's predominantly on community solidarity and not on citizenship. So apparently there is a need to introduce more content on the citizenship portion. So baka kailangan talaga na pagbigyan ng pansin na yung citizenship aspect kasi nga we always say or there's always advocacy, let's have voters education uh, prior to elections, no? During the campaign, vote wisely, but uh, Maybe it should be done prior to that no? in, in a continuous manner. Okay, let's proceed. Okay, I just have a few minutes left. Uh, so in terms of the gaps, uh, there is a lack of time spent on civic education. Uh, so we, we use the NVivo content software to, to do this thematic analysis. So in terms of differing module contents, okay, there are differing module contents and the focus veers away from civic education. So uh, given this understanding, uh, as I, I've been uh, emphasizing, we need to bring back civic education. Uh, it's there in the curriculum, but in the content area. Some schools have no co-curricular activities, there's a need for teacher training on civic education. There are lack, there is a lack of avenues for civic education or civic engagement and minimal interaction with the social sectors. So ito mga direct quotes yung nasa kanan, no? Uh, one teacher said, the struggle is in the preparation of materials and modules, development of the curriculum, and even in translation. Training is important. There is a need for support mechanisms. Okay, on the right-hand portion, uh, you can see a quote from one of our informants. This or civic education should not be taught in grade 10 alone. Grade 7 pa lang may particular topic na about civic engagement. For senior high school, it can be added to all strands and that would be much better. Okay, so good uh, recommendations, uh, uh, especially because the K-12 program is being reviewed at this time. Next slide. Okay, I'll, I'll go quickly now. The results in terms of our uh, research on NGOs. Next slide. So uh, there's a variety of topics. So this is more of a non-formal civic education. As you can see, the variety of topics you can find from uh, voter education. So uh, it's being carried by, uh, by NGO advocacy groups and um, anti-sexual harassment, uh, youth empowerment programs, human rights education. Next slide. In terms of the sectors, uh, because NGOs, of course, are voluntary groups, they, they work with various sectors. You can see this in terms of uh, focus sectors. Next slide. In terms of mode of learning, uh, since we are in a pandemic, so you, you notice on the left side, uh, blended learning is the key or the main mode of learning. Uh, of course, for NGOs, uh, especially in those in the local communities, they also do face-to-face, -face, of course, using or following health protocols. In terms of program type, you can see on the right side, uh, workshops and seminars, information campaigns. Okay, so those are the uh, types of uh, uh, civic education that is rolled out. No? Usually, mga one to two days workshop or seminar. Next slide. 
Okay, we just have this uh, quotes uh, from the NGO key informants. We have various development partners and a strong network of local organizations. And our programs are based on the needs of the locality. Uh, you can see on the right side of this uh, screen, our volunteers are very diverse. This allows us to have a multidisciplinary approach in the conduct of training activities. And the topics are selected based on the feedback from participants. As you know, uh, it's very demand-driven, no? Yung kailangan ng mga different sectors, different uh, communities. As you can see, the fluidity and adaptability of our materials contributed to the effectiveness of our programs. Next slide. On the gaps. Okay, uh, pinapatapos na yata ako. Ayan, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, last slide na actually yung kanina. The weakness stems from the lack of a structured program. And we realize the need to have a playbook and a manual to guide the implementation process. No? Uh, so normally nga, wala naman silang modules except for some groups. So what they have are yung conference program, workshop program. And I, I know this because we also do this uh, kind of training. And uh, yeah, uh, it's difficult to find funding for our projects because uh, these are voluntary efforts. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, these are the next steps that we are undertaking in this project. So, uh, developing co-curricular modules and training manuals. When we say co-curricular Ano na yan, no? additional na yan. So, pwedeng magkaroon ng mga conference or magkaroon ng guest speaker. Iniisip ko nga, baka ang dapat na guest speaker yung mga NGOs. No? Kasi marami na silang specific content area. And then, uh, teachers and facilitators training and private school and NGO partnerships. So, thank you very much. Uh, last slide ko yung thank you. Uh, sorry, Sheila. Medyo napahaba. Oh, no problem, you, uh, Dr. Kiko Magno. Maraming salamat. That was a very uh, enlightening presentation. So we saw in Dr. Uh, Kiko's presentation that although civic education is being taught in private schools and through NGOs, there's still plenty of gaps no, that must be filled to make this uh, civic uh, education programs uh, impactful, particularly gaps in uh, uh, in terms of the content and delivery of these programs. We'll hear more from Dr. Kiko in the open forum. Okay, so at this point, let us go back to uh, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta for uh, his uh, welcome message. Dr. Arbeta, please. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Thank you, uh, Dr. Magno, for filling up the gap. I was uh, not mindful of the time and caught up in a administrative matter. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the following officials who took the time from their busy schedule to join us this morning. Uh, from the government, we have the House of Representatives, uh, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director Rosemary Sawali. We have Department of Education Bureau of Learning Resources Director Aris Belson Akai Kawilan. Uh, National Economic Development Authority, OIC Assistant Director Edgardo around his Jr. And Philippine Consul General in Melbourne, uh, Maria Lourdes Salcedo. Department of Education, Palawan Principal Arlene Manalo. Cagayan de Oro Youth Development Office Administrator, Rigori Luis Magbanua. As Sangguniang Kabataan Chairpersons from the various barangays nationwide. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following Kasuga Integrated Farm School owner, Sherlyn Kasuga, University of the Philippines Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, Richard Philip Gonzalo, University of San Carlos Office of Population Studies Foundation Incorporated Director, Nanette Lee Mayol, uh, Manuel Inverga, University Foundation Director, Maria Isabel Granada, Cagayan uh, de Oro Technical Vocational Education Administrator, Maria Victoria Trinidad, Sevier University Ateneo de Cagayan Junior High School Assistant Principal, Anito Librando Jr. From CSOs and NGOs, we have Mandaluyong Integrated Farmers Association President, Jamil uh, 
Denimil uh, Garay, and uh, Integrated Rural Development Foundation Executive Director uh, R.C. Glipo, and National Federations of Cooperatives, Children, and Youth Unit Head, Hazel Ann Modeno. Modeno. Uh, friends from media, and uh, we also like to say good morning to you, and let me also greet our guests and colleagues from the government, academic, social, uh, civic society, uh, media, uh, private sector, and those watching this forum through PIDS Facebook and the SERPI community Facebook pages. I welcome all of you to this virtual forum organized by our socioeconomic research portal for the Philippines project or SERPI, an initiative of PIDS launched in September 2000 to serve as a common link between government and research institutions and provide an open access repository of socioeconomic information that policymakers, educators, and students can use. We started as an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by PIDS, other government agencies, and academic and research organizations in the Philippines, and has evolved into a network of institutions with shared passion for knowledge generation and knowledge exchange. At present, the Serpi network consists of 58 partner institutions. The increasing support of the research community and other government agencies motivates us to work harder in further developing the Serpi and cultivating our network to serve as a venue for promoting research and stimulating innovation for the public good. Today, we are con conducting the second installment of the Serpi knowledge sharing seminar series. This initiative features our partner institutions' research outputs and development initiatives to give our network members a wider platform to disseminate their studies and engage with the public. For this forum, we have uh, chosen a theme capacity, capacitating and uh, investing in the youth for public and resilient, for productive and resilient uh, future to underscore the urgent need to address the challenges faced by the youth in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The COVID-19 COVID pandemic has affected all segments of the population with the young population among those who bore the brunt. The Global Assorbian Youth and COVID-19 conducted by the International Labor Organization shows that the pandemic's impact on young people or those between 18 to 29 years old is systematic, deep, and disproportionate. It has a particular hard, it was particularly hard on the young women, younger youth, and those in lower income countries. In areas of education, the survey found that not all young people were able to transition into online and distance learning successfully, and one in eight had no access to courses, teaching, or training. In terms of employment, the survey also reported that one in six young people who had a job before outbreak lost work. Some, their work hours fell by nearly a quarter. Two out of five young people experienced a reduction in income. Another significant blow to the youth was the increase in anxiety and depression. This can lead to learning and working disruptions besides the psychological fear of contracting uh, COVID-19. Here at home, we uh, have witnessed all these negative impacts of COVID-19 among young Filipinos, some of whom may be the people close to us or whom we know personally. Given the devastated uh, effects of COVID-19 on the youth, helping them heal for uh, economic, social, and psychological scar inflicted by the pandemic is a duty of uh, us healers. They say the youth is the hope of the future and has never been more important than today when we as a nation are trying to recover from this pandemic and building more resilient Philippines that is ready to face the next crisis. Capacitating and investing on our young people is key to a productive and resilient post-pandemic Philippines. As tomorrow's leaders and stewards of the nation, they are our hope. Thus, we should ensure that they are empowered, capacitated, nurtured, and future-ready to become responsible, productive, and resilient citizens. Against this context, we frame this virtual forum with the diverse topics among the youth, 
We are featuring studies of some of our SERP partner institutions on enhancing civic education curriculum, uh, understanding the conservation behavior among college students and the role that education plays and exploring youth development outcomes in agri-based youth clubs to capacitate our young people for successful employment and entrepreneurship experience, we need to have a quality and robust education and training system. Thus, we also have a presentation tackling the profile and barriers of training participation of our young people and another presentation uh, about a toolkit that will help learners determine uh, various uh, options available to them. We are grateful for for the time and expertise our presenters are shaping with us today, including their institution's continued support to SRP. Allow me to thank our resource person, uh, Dr. Francisco Magno of the La Salle University, which you already heard, uh, uh, Political Science De uh, and Development Studies Department, uh, and the Jesse Robredo Institute of Governance, and Dr. Homer Yabot of the LSU Psychology Department, Mr. Uh, Sunny Pasiona of the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, Ms. Yolanda Castillo de Las Alas of CMU uh, Regional Center for Edu Educational Innovation and Technology, and Mr. John Paul uh, Corpus of, of, of course, PIDS. All of our CERB partners, uh, we thank, thank you very much for your continued support. And to all the participants here in Zoom and Facebook Live, thank you for spending your Thursday morning with us. Let us participate in today's discussion by listening to the presentations with an open mind and inquiring mind. Let us not hesitate to ask questions and share our ideas as well. This is the beauty of a public forum. Thank you. And I give back the floor to the narrator. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta. So at this point, uh, before we resume the presentations, may I request all our speakers, including Dr. Arbeta, Zeki, our SERP coordinator, and Ms. Emmy Domingo, who's uh, representing our resource person from CMU in the tech to turn on their videos for a brief photo opportunity. Uh, we will be assisted by a platform host, Thea. Uh, Thea, please. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Um, we're just waiting for Dr. Yabut to uh, open his uh, camera. Okay, so we're now complete. So may I ask every, um, for a while, um, and Dr. Sani. Ah, okay, Dr. Sani is here. Okay, po. so put on your best smile. Okay, one, two, three, smile for a while, po. Uh, one more. One, two, three, smile. Ma'am Sheila, um, okay na po. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thea. Okay. Friends, one aspect where the youth can play an important role is environmental conservation. And that is uh, the topic of our next presenter, who is also from the De La Salle University. Let us listen, <laughs> Dr. Homer Yabut who is a licensed, a psycho licensed uh, psychologist and associate professor in the, Department of, in the Department of Psychology of the LSU. His research includes religion and spirituality, collective actions, religious mass gatherings, and political psychology. He was uh, involved in internationally and locally funded research on maternal and neonatal health services scholarships in the Philippines, indigenous cultures in the Philippines, and DSWD case management systems and practices. Previously, Dr. Yabot was affiliated with uh, Mahidol University in Thailand and Sophia University in Japan as an associate visiting professor. Dr. Yabot, you may proceed. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to present for this morning the conservation behavior among students in university in a selected university in Metro Manila, the moderating role of attitudes on the impact of environmental, uh, on the moderating role of attitudes on the impact of environmental knowledge on conservation behavior. So most of the time we have this um, notion that when we know something about a phenomenon or knowledge 
for example, a while ago, civic, uh, about civic education or in, my, in our other paper, democracy, we expect people to behave accordingly uh, to their knowledge. So we explored if that, that, that is also true in conservation behavior in the environment. So we will present, I will present today our paper uh, together with Anne Simpao about this um, conservation behaviors of students in a university in Metro Manila. Okay. So professionals and practitioners in various disciplines assert the need to utilize natural resources as a determinant of development. However, research has shown that industrialization, urban, urbanization, and modernization have caused severe depletion of natural resources and degradation of the environment. So this reality is among many other forms of development, hence the, needs, hence the need for responsible, conservative, and sustainable actions, which are also the sustainable development goals. Goals aims. So globally, a lack of human interest and pro-environmental behaviors threaten ecosystem. Various efforts are made to change behaviors in reducing harmful impacts to the, to the environment. The Philippines, being part of the global south, is seen to be part of the most problematic countries in the world on having low scores on the Environmental Performance in the Index, indicating pro-environmental behavior, poor pro-environmental behavior practices of Filipinos. So let's discuss um, pro-environmental behaviors. So this pro-environmental behaviors refer to, refers to the actions of individuals and communities that aim to benefit and is the harm to the natural environment. Understanding pro-environmental behaviors are vital in protecting and reducing harmful effects on the environment. PEB takes on several domains, such as environmental activism and conservation behavior. So water and energy conservation behavior and other pro-environmental behaviors include recycling, green conduct, eco-initiative, and green behavior. Specifically, when we talk about conservation behavior, it refers to the public's willingness to, rec to recycle or live a lifestyle that has a smaller environmental impact. CB also explores many domains and measures, but primarily focuses on three key issues, energy, water, and forest conservation. Along with the CB, domains and practices are practices that include soil conservation, sustainable energy consumption, agricultural conservation, and good irrigation practices in work, school, and home. So the question now, is this one. So what leads to conservation behaviors? According to a commentary by Bloomstein 2015, behaviors to, related to conservation lack explanation. Hence, there is a need to further look into conservation behavior at different levels, such as the group and community, and its effects in the environmental and social aspects. We argue that environmental knowledge can lead to conservation behaviors, and past research shows that action-related knowledge has a higher impact on conservation behavior. However, knowledge alone is not sufficient to make people display conservation behaviors. Some studies show that environmental knowledge will, will only lead to environmental behavior if there is environmental em emotional arousal, we propose that positive attitudes about conservation can further enhance the relationship between environmental knowledge and conservation behaviors. So this is in line with the theory of planned behavior wherein attitude is one important component that can predict the intention of doing something. So this is quite, uh, no, no, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, intuitively common sense, we assume that pag maraming alam, gagawin, no? And this is also true in, uh, in our other research. The more we know about democracy, it will translate to behaviors. But 
but this this has been a problem of social psychologists no we it's not uh it's not that um simple no so there are other factors for example um uh, uh, well done social norms injunctive norms so these are very important things also to check but in this research we just simply uh focused on the attitudes so hypothesis we argue that environmental knowledge can lead to conservation behaviors so for the first one there is a direct direct positive relationship between environmental knowledge and engagement in conservation behavior we propose that positive attitudes about conservation behavior can further enhance the relationship between environmental knowledge and conservation behaviors and then hypothesis two positive attitude towards conservation moderates the relationship between environmental knowledge and environmental concern towards conservation behavior so this research aims to describe conservation behaviors to understand the factors and extent of engagement in conservation practices among university students specifically it aims to describe the important roles of knowledge and attitude in understanding conservation behavior among students so it's a cross-sectional descriptive correlational research design uh, it's the the, the, the participants are, came from a private university and, uh, and during the analysis 303 uh, protocols were included so we utilize a five-page online self-administrative third questionnaire okay so so here these are the mean level mean scores and standard deviations um, I will show you the results in a while so here are the background factors no for the descriptive results so female university students reported to have higher environmental knowledge and attitudes con towards conservation behavior than male university students in terms of age older university students are more knowledgeable of environment related matters in terms of family income um, university students with a family income of 20,000 and below uh, and 20,000 to 40,000 have higher levels of conservation behavior compared to those with a family income of 40,000 and above no? so baga lower SES mas uh, higher levels of conservation short discussion about the descriptive results females um, are more inclined to engage in pro-environmental be behaviors this may be due to a women's greater affinity and support in the environment as supported by previous studies most university students who are 27 years old and above provide support for their families and themselves making them limit the use of basic necessities and other spendings in terms of educational attainment um it, it was uh, found to be always a strong driver of environmental engagement college students usually have positive attitudes towards the environment in terms of the three main variables uh students have high levels of environmental knowledge conservation behavior and conservation attitude towards conservation behavior and conservation behavior so as we as we can see in the correlations um environmental knowledge and conservation behavior had a weak positive correlation so compared to environmental knowledge mas matas yung attitude attitude towards conservation behavior and conservation were moderately positively correlated so when we run the regression there was a significant interaction between environmental knowledge and attitude in affecting conservation behaviors so so kahit marami kang alam or even if you have the knowledge that will only uh predict conservation behavior kapag mataas yung attitude as you can see here the moderating effect of attitude towards conservation behavior is only applicable when the level is at the average and high so even if you have knowledge pag mababa naman yung attitude mo it will not translate to conservation behaviors so i think that's a very important finding uh, 
from this simple study that we can share no and uh ito nga, we can also apply this eh, or at we can also study attitudes and other things for example subjective norms um and other things with uh, uh perceived behavioral control in the theory of planned behavior in, in studying democracy and other important things in our society okay so so this study found that environmental knowledge has a significant effect on conservation behavior so this this result attests to the relative importance of environmental knowledge in their contributions to the environmental action whether about conservation or other pro-environmental behaviors so mahalaga pa rin yung knowledge syempre no environmental knowledge students learn in universities can also be used to promote sustainable consumption practices we're not saying na hindi mahalaga mahalaga yung knowledge no it's really very important and therefore uh, to shape attitudes or more importantly values kasi lalim yung values no we start early i remember when i was in grade school marami na kaming campaigns no no lit no littering we had activities na to really ano no uh, that are really environmentally friendly uh, another thing uh, the results support the hypothesis that attitude con towards conservation behavior has a moderation effect so environment environmental knowledge alone is not sufficient for students to display cd there should be a change in environmental attitude for them to display the cd a uh, change of attitudes among people is needed to address environmental issues and achieve sustainable development. So this is vital, no? Uh, so in a university setting, students are taught with environmental knowledge with the influence of their attitudes to environmental education influences pro-environmental pro pro behaviors. So um, we, overall, this study on this study on predictors and moderators of students' conservation behavior showed a significant relationship among the variables. And um, so a high level of environmental knowledge suggests a high engagement level in conservation behavior. But, but uh, an important factor is the attitude, the average and high levels of attitude towards and conservation behavior suggest a moderating effect on environmental knowledge and conservation behavior. So knowledge is a two-way street. Educational institutions should focus more on environmental topics which are action-oriented and promote sustainable practices. So it's not just the simple na transmissive na knowledge we transfer. Uh, there, are, there should also be other activities because attitudes are shaped all are by subjective norms or social norms. No? Kaya nga chicken and the egg eh. So, it can be, it can come from social norms, injunctive norms. And at the same time, students must also make an effort to be knowledgeable of environmental matters, both out, inside and outside of their campus. Universe, universities need not only to teach about conservation behavior, but also perform practices, no? And impose regulations that will help students have a positive look at conservation behavior. So, Looking back, nung bata ako, mukhang effective nga, no, yung, kasi, nung, hanggang ngayon, tumanda na, when I see people na nagkatapon sa daan, parang nainis ako, nagagalit. So, parang galing yun nung bata ako, no, we had this, pag nagtapon ka, penalized ka. So, it was not really, ano, no, so yung attitude ko na form, uh, bata pa ako, no, so it was not, just simply a matter of yung diniscuss sa classroom. It's more on the societal level or school level, no? School level norms. Thank you for listening, no? I hope uh, I was able to, I mean, you were able to learn a few things about our research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Homer Yabut, for your interesting uh, study that showed the links between environmental knowledge, environmental attitude in and in conservation uh, behavior. As I was listening to you, uh, actually your presentation ties uh, 
ties well with the first uh, paper shared by Dr. Kiko because that paper talked about civic education, instilling knowledge and civic engagement. But as uh, you argued and as was shown in your study, knowledge alone does not necessarily lead to a change in behavior unless there is also a change in attitude. Okay, so we will hear more from Dr. Homer Yabut uh, during the open forum. So from that topic, let us uh, go to a study about youth engagement in community-based agriculture projects. And to present that study is Mr. Sonny Pashona, who is from the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, or CIRCA, um, where he... Uh, um, where he is the Senior Communications Associate of the Partnerships Unit. And he also manages Circus Banner Youth Initiative called Young Forces for Agricultural Innovation. And uh, he also leads the Circa Youth Ambassadors Platform as a pioneering initiative for mainstreaming youth empowerment and participation in central-wide and external affairs of Circa. He has a decade-long experience in the youth and community development advocacy as lead and independent consultant of research and development projects in urban and rural communities. Uh, Mr. Sunny Pashona, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Ms. Sheila, for the kind introduction. Allow me to share my screen. All right, good morning. Again, thank you very much for inviting Sierka to this um, very relevant forum. So I'm here to present a study called Exploring Youth Development Outcomes in Agri-Based Youth Clubs and some insights for rural youth investments and engagement in agriculture. So just a uh, brief background there for this study. There's a global recognition, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Urbeta, that young people are critical resources for the world's development agenda. 90% of the youth are in developing countries and roughly half of them are in rural areas. And the, in the literature, we've also had um, too much focus on youth engagement in agriculture, but there's actually less investigation on the role of adults. And we see the need to examine outcomes of youth engagement in agriculture to young people themselves. So for this study, the main objective is um, examining youth adult engagement in community-based agriculture projects, and it's linked to positive youth development outcomes among the 4-H youth of Bicol, Philippines. So this study pursued four objectives, which I will discuss in the next slides. So to illustrate, this is the conceptual framework of the study, examining the context of the 4-H youth uh, individually and organizationally. We have the independent variables of youth adult engagement with three dimensions. Um, then we have the dependent variables, which are the positive youth development outcomes. So the study um, employed an exploratory sequential mix methods involving KAIs, um, FGDs, document reviews, non-participant observation, and surveys. So the study was conducted in two provinces of Bicol, Camarines Norte, and Albay. And uh, there were 10 clubs, uh, five clubs in each province, and a total of 154 respondents. So uh, to illustrate again uh, the the sequential mixed methods. Uh, the study was divided into three phases from phase one, uh, primarily qualitative, phase two, uh, the development of the instrument and the quantitative, and phase three is more on the validation and the finaliz finalization of the results. And reflexivity was also employed throughout the study. So let's get to know first about 4-H um, Club. So it, it is an organization of out-of-school youth, OSY, and in-school youth involved in agriculture programs and livelihood projects for the fourfold development of the head, heart, hands, and health. So, kaya po siya 4-H. Uh, for single youth, uh, uh, age 15 to 30 years old, and membership is open and voluntary. And again, it emphasizes community-based projects in agriculture and homemaking. And 4-H is actually designed as well to be an avenue for farm family development. 
So 4-H Club today, uh, perhaps some of the audience are also members of 4-H Club or have been a member of 4-H Club. So staple programs uh, organized by DA, by ATI are training programs, internships in Taiwan, in Japan. Then they have this um, annual youth summits or youth camps, and they actually have a a regional or municipal or provincial versions of these youth camps where they engage in networking activities and seminars and learning opportunities related to agriculture and youth development. So uh, within the community setting, uh, of course, the clubs, uh, there, there are at least one, uh, there, there, there's at least one uh, club that can be organ organized in a barangay. So clubs have a set of officers and a volunteer leader. So when you volunteer leader, ito po yung parang advisor nila. Um, then uh, they engage, they are required to engage in community-based agriculture projects. It could be individual or it could be by group. And the nature of projects are actually wide-ranging depending on the preferences of young people and of course the priorities of the local government. So let's have some social demographic um, profile of the 4-H youth on average, uh, 21 years old, 47%, um, 53% um, gender segregation. Uh, almost 80% of the surveyed respondents are in-school youth. 64% of the ISY are in college. And on average, 2.72 years, they've been a 4 h -er for uh, 2.72 years, so that's within one to three years. So many of them have joined the 4-H club actually um, for the last three years, including the at, the at the height of the pandemic. In terms of membership, 40%. Uh, hold leadership positions in the club. So there are there there's at least uh, eight eight um, set of officers uh, in each club. Twenty seven percent are with other youth organizations. So this could be with SK, Sangguni Ang Kabataan, um, student councils, and other relevant youth organizations in their community. And seventy two percent come from a farming family. So let's look at the enablers of participation. So there are three main themes, experien experiential, social, psychological, and economic. So experiential because a lot of them are really more on, into experiential learning, specifically on uh, developing their skills related to agriculture. Social, psychological, uh, there's also, uh, we've seen as well the um, desire to engage in socialization activities, uh, when they do communal gardens, for instance, or when they join the youth camps where they are able to uh, network with other young people in their province or in their municipality. Uh, also the economic, because they uh, since they engage in livelihood projects, they also um, venture into um, income generating activities. But on the economic side, I would also like to highlight that it's not necessarily about the income because it's um, the main goal of generating income is for them to have um, um, not for person, not necessarily for personal benefit, but more on for um, funding their socialization activities. So, sa mga bata, they parang they get excited whenever they have income kunyari, from the harvest from their garden, kasi magagamit nila yun for socialization activities, mag excursion sila, or mag, uh, mag the team building activities sila. So it's somewhat related to the psychological, social psychological enabler. So these three themes of enablers of participation are uh, framed within an enabling environment, specifically the support of adults in the community, uh, for each coordinators, uh, typically these are um, uh, agriculturists, uh, technicians from the muni uh, municipal governments, volunteer leaders, their parents, uh, their local officials, and other um, adults within the community. Now we look into the barriers of youth participation. Uh, ano yung mga huwipigil sa kanila or what hinders them from participating in their projects and activities. Primarily uh, is academic commitment because we've noted that 80% are in-school youth. So kahit nag-pandemic, uh, nag uh, some of them, many of them turned into modular uh, into modular education. So 
uh, kahit na gusto po nilang sumali sa mga agriculture projects nila sa community, uh, they are hindered by academic commitments and also household and family duties because we've noted that um, many of the young young people engaged in 4-H are still dependent uh, in their family and their parents. Other themes are, of course, religious commitments. Uh, meron silang gagawin sa simbahan, occupational, work outside the community, specifically for those who are graduates already or nagtatrabaho na. Uh, and then political, because again, we've noted that uh, some of them are engaged in SKs and, and, uh, and in other um, student councils in the university or other uh, political engagements that they have. So now we look into youth adult engagement. Again, I'd like to emphasize that the, this, uh, this construct has three dimensions, uh, youth involvement, adult involvement, and youth adult interaction. So what you can see in this table is in general, there is a high level of youth adult engagement uh, among the 4-H clubs of PCOL. So anong ibig sabihin ito? So this basically means that for each dimension, uh, there's uh, very high youth involvement wherein young people provide leadership uh, from the design to the implementation of these projects and in mobilizing their resources. There's also a high level of adult involvement where uh, the adults in the community provide advisory uh, or mentorship and resource sharing roles. Uh, limbawa, kapag nakita nila na uh, walang, walang pampasnaks yung uh, mga bata or kulay yung pondo, some of the adults take, uh, uh, provide financial support for them or resource sharing rules or as simple as uh, pagpapahiram ng mga gardening tools sa mga bata when they engage in communal gardens. And finally, the youth-adult interaction dimension. Uh, we've seen that uh, they interact through, again, mentorship built in a high level of trust. So there's a high level of trust in terms of decision making that, that young uh, mutually uh, they respect each other and then they, they trust each other in terms of coming up with decisions or they the adults trust um, young people and their decisions and what they prefer in terms of their projects and adults themselves uh, being trusted by young people that they look up to them and they rely on their expertise on some aspects of the projects. And then this um, process results to a good camaraderie. So Maramin uh, Sasabi from the research participants that uh, they have a very uh, strong uh, camaraderie within the community because of their engagements in 4-H club. So using the theoretical perspective of uh, the typology of youth participation and empowerment or the type model, uh, these findings uh, provide insights that um, among the 4-H club, uh, it shows a pluralistic type of participation where th wherein there's a shared control over decision making. Uh, according to this theory, uh, th that's an ideal social arrangement for positive youth development and empowerment, wherein young people have voice and active participant role, and adults' presence is to maximize conditions and opportunities for youth, and their involvement is not overly dominant nor underinvolved. Kumbaga, sa madaling sabi, sakto lang po yung involvement nila, not overly dominant but uh, not underinvolved as well. Now we look into uh, positive youth development outcomes. It's, this is a strengths-based perspective that views young people as resources to be developed rather than problems to be solved. Uh, and the aim is maximizing youth potentials rather than addressing problems. And uh, the one of the famous um, theories on this is the perspective of learner in terms of promoting the five Cs. Uh, competence, confidence, connection, caring, character, and then in the recent decade, a, the, the 6C, which is the contribution, was added to this theory. So in general, there's a high level of um, positive youth development outcomes among the 4-H youth. And if you will notice here, the 13th statement, uh, I understand better the problems of Filipino farmers and the agriculture sector. So there's that um, sense of appreciation uh, in the agriculture sector. Now, um, since we've discussed youth adult engagement, YAE, and the positive youth development, uh, we uh, attempted to describe the relationship and we came up with three models 
Model one, basically what it says is youth adult engagement is a predictor of positive youth development. Model two, uh, only youth involvement and adult involvement are significantly uh, explain, significantly explain variables of the PYD outcomes. And in model three, without even without the youth adult uh, involvement dimension, youth involvement and adult involvement remain significant, uh, remains as a significant predictor even with improved coefficients. And it confirms that youth adult involve, involvement is not a mediating variable. So in summary, this is the final um, model uh, responding to the research question. Uh, enhancing youth adult engagement yields improve positive youth development outcomes among the 4-H youth. So if you will see here, um, these are the three dimensions of YAE, youth adult interaction, adult involvement, youth involvement. Uh, enhancing them makes uh, improvements in terms of the PYD outcomes, the six Cs. The study also looked into the uh, career intentions of the 4 H youth because madalas po siyang nababanggit during the interviews. So um, we've noted that 75% are likely to pursue agriculture-related courses in the university. Half of them are likely to pursue agriculture on a part-time basis, 26% uh, full-time. So marami nagsasabi dito that um, they may not uh, engage on a full-time basis in agriculture related in the future. However, uh, they express that they still want to be engaged in agriculture, perhaps as a, as a weekend farmer or bilang uh, part-time lang or uh, sideline lang nila. They might engage in hydroponics, but not on a full-time basis. And uh, we also ask if given the economic opportunities in their community, 69% stands to stay and 22% might stay. 9% are not sure at this time, but none said no to this scenario. So, because we, they were asked if um, kapag pinigyan, kung meron bang economic opportunities or meron mga pagkakataon or uh, pagkakataon para kumita sa community mo, mas gugustuhin mo ba na dito ka na lang sa community ninyo or gusto mo pang umalis? So, walang nagsabing no to this uh, scenario. Alright, so last few minutes, uh, some key messages from this study, I'd like to focus on this slide. Uh, we've seen that youth engagement in agriculture goes beyond the youth themselves because we've seen that adults, especially those in the communities, they play a meaningful and, in, in, and an enabling role for both the positive development of the youth and their communities. I'd like to quote uh, Wong on this, uh, where, where they said that uh, youth, young people cannot be expected to carry the full burden of empowering themselves in their communities, adults ought to share in, the, in this responsibility. So, ibig sabihin, hindi lang tayo puro youth, but we also look into the roles of adults for youth engagement and youth development. And we've seen in this study that critical foundations for rural youth empowerment, it can be nurtured in agri-based youth clubs, and their engagement in agri-based youth clubs uh, particularly in the case of 4-H, it enhances their social psychological skills, social capital, and sense of appreciation of and contribution to agriculture, among others. So hindi natin kailangang, uh, we don't need to look far because in the rural communities, there are opportunities already for rural youth empowerment. There are challenges, yes, but uh, in the case of 4-H club, we've seen how these young people were able to uh, maximize their resources or mobilize their resources and with the adults playing an enabling role. Again, um, we've seen that enhancing youth involvement and adult involvement enhances the dynamics of youth and in adult interactions that are critical for the youth's transition to adulthood. So, uh, nakita natin advisory role ng mga parents, ng volunteer leaders, even ng local officials, how they nurture these young people and help them transition into adulthood. 
And finally, um, we've seen that 4-H Club has a positive influence to the career intentions of the youth that are in favor to agriculture and rural development. So in the study, we've actually uh, debunked the myth that young people don't want to farm anymore or, or they want to leave the rural areas. Because among the respondents, if my opportunities naman sa rural communities, they would rather stay there. But of course, there are some program and policy recommendations on how we can uh, work towards that direction. So some recommendations, um, one is to, in terms of education, formal and non-formal education, emphasize the food systems approach in the curriculum, trainings, and other capacity building activities so as to expand their awareness and options uh, in terms of career that they want to pursue. Uh, we've noted that uh, many of these uh, community-based projects are more on the production side, but perhaps when they have a bigger picture on the wider agri-food system, when they have knowledge and awareness on those aspects, it might expand their um, career options related to that. Uh, second, uh, this is somewhat uh, related to the first presentation by Dr. Magno. Of course, there's an, a, a need for strengthened youth leadership, organizational development, and project management skills of the 4-H youth. And of course, again, as we've noted, that it's not just about young people themselves, but also the adults in the community. So uh, trainings for adults or adult learning interventions are also critical, especially on topics on how to work with young people. Because and that many insights uh, in the communities uh, with these voluntary leaders on how they work with young people. So it might be an opportunity to share best practices and how to enhance uh, their work with young people. A uh, fourth, of course, is improving access to capital and capacity for value added activities because, again, we've noted that it's a more on the production side and enhancing uh, youth participation in the policy process, uh, both at the local and national level. And uh, since we have the Philippine Youth Development Plan to be developed uh, soon, uh, I guess uh, there's a greater call for uh, enhancing youth participation in the policy process. And we've noted here that uh, the 4-H club members, they exhibit um, a shared control in terms of decision-making, which is a good practice for organizational governance. And finally, it's nurturing relationships of 4-H with local institutions, uh, specifically uh, with Sangguni Ang Kabataan. Then we also have the local youth development offices because uh, these are, in terms of policy uh, action, uh, working with them would be very critical. Uh, because one of the challenges of the 4-H clubs is actually in sustaining their community-based projects because walang pondo or kulang, inga, kulang sa resources. So it's it's very critical for them to be engaged in the political process or in the policy-making process by working closely with SKs, LYDOs, and the local government in general. So that's it for my study. And I also invite you to check out our website uh, where you can have some access to our um, related relevant publications to this topic. Yun lang po, Jos Mabalos, and uh, have a beautiful day. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sani Pashona of uh, CERCA for your interesting uh, presentation that shows how we can leverage 4-H uh, clubs as an avenue for youth uh, participation. And uh, one way that uh, that can be done, as he uh, underscored, is through more active youth adult engagement. As Sani uh, underscored in one of his slides, adults play a meaningful and enabling role for both the positive development of the youth and their communities. Okay, so at this point, let us jump to education and training, particularly to technical and vocational education, which play an essential role in capacitating our youth by uh, providing them with skills and practical experience that may uh, give them employment opportunities. And our speaker for this topic is Mr. John Paul Corpus, a supervising research specialist at PIBS. Uh, uh, JP holds a master's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines de Le Mans and is currently part of the of the PIDS macroeconomics team. He has been involved in studies on social protection, youth education, financial inclusion, and uh, fiscal uh, sustainability. Okay, uh, his areas of interest are in development and macroeconomics. Okay. Uh, Mr. JP Corpus, you now have the virtual floor. 
Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Mang Sheila. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. So uh, my presentation is titled uh, The Youth Need in the Philippines, uh, Profile and Barriers to Training Participation. Uh, it is based on a discussion paper titled Who Are the Youth Need in the Philippines Today, which I co-authored with uh, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta, PIBS President, and Nina Araos, who was a former research analyst at PIBS. So before I begin my presentation, let me say a few words about this paper. So we wrote this paper around March to April 2021, and it was published as a discussion paper in August of 2021. So this paper and the data that we used in it are a bit dated, and we haven't updated the paper. So please keep that in mind. And also, this is one of the two papers on youth need and uh, TVET that we wrote for TESDA and TBED, the Philippine Business for Education, which is part of their broader initiative to make uh, training programs more relevant for disadvantaged youth in the Philippines. So we'd like to acknowledge them for the support that we received for the study. Next slide. Okay, so... Uh, first of all, who are the youth NEET and why is it important to study them? So NEET stands for uh, youth, meaning people who are aged uh, 15 to 24, who are not in employment, education, or training. So um, NEET are an important subgroup, subgroup of the youth because these, in these ages, in these ages uh, we would normally expect the youth to be in school. Uh, either in high school or in college, or they could be uh, taking technical vocational training, or they can be employed since these are the ages when people normally transition from attending school to working. But the need, the need are youth who are not doing any of these. So meaning these, these youth are transitioning to adulthood, but they are not accumulating the human capital, meaning uh, knowledge, skills, and experience, which they need to become uh, productive adults. So because the need are uh, entering adulthood without uh, or lacking the skills and knowledge and experience, this can impair their uh, prospects of, of finding a good job or a decent or earning a decent uh, living. And uh, this can in turn have a lasting impact, a lasting negative impact on their uh, socioeconomic situation. So uh, one of the key policy questions that arises is what are the strategies that uh, we can pursue in order to engage the need? So from the perspective of our partners in the study, TESDA and PBED, uh, TVET or uh, Technical Vocational Education and Training uh, can play an important role in um, engaging the Filipino need because TVET can provide a uh, an alternative pathway for, for the youth to gain knowledge and skills, which can uh, they then uh, uh, use to secure employment. So it is important for us to think about how we can encourage need or help the need to participate in, in TVET. Uh, next slide. Okay, so our paper actually has five research questions, but because of the limited time, this presentation is only going to focus on two of them. So the first one is, who are the need in the Philippines? So here we aim to give a profile of the need. And the second one is, what are the barriers that keep need from pursuing technical vocational education and training, or TVET? Next slide. Okay, so to answer the uh, first research question, we performed a simple analysis of household survey data, particularly the uh, 2019 rounds of the labor force survey. And we also used the merged uh, labor force survey and family income and expenditure survey from 2018. And to answer the second question, we uh, collected data through an online survey of former NEET who were training or applying for a program at TESDA or uh, YouthWorks PH. YouthWorks PH is a, a project of PBED and the USAID 
which is basically a training scholarship with uh, that's targeted for or targeted towards uh, neat youth in uh, in selected areas in the country. Next slide. Okay, so first we discuss the profile of the Filipino need. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the need are commonly measured using labor force surveys. And in the Philippines, um, the PSA, the Philippine Statistics Authority, has been publishing need statistics uh, since uh, 2019 using data collected from its, from its LFS. So to measure the need, we only need four variables. First is age. Uh, that's to determine who the youth are. And then uh, the employment variable to determine whether the youth are employed or not. So if a person is uh, not employed, they could either be unemployed, meaning uh, they don't have a job, but they're looking for a job, or they can be uh, economically inactive meaning they don't have a job, but they're not looking for a job. Uh, next is an education variable to determine if uh, the youth are attending school. So normally for these ages, they would be attending secondary or tertiary education. And then finally, you need a training variable to determine if they are participating in a technical or vocational training. Next slide. Okay, so this uh, graph shows uh, the, PS, the PSA's estimates of the need population and the need incidents from 2019 to April uh, to 2022. Uh, so the need incidents is the share of uh, Filipino youth who are need. So that is represented by the orange markers in this graph, which are connected by the, by the orange line. And the blue bars represent the need population. So as of April 2022, there were about uh, 2.38 million need in the Philippines, which is about our youth population. So in terms of trends, uh, we can see here that the need incidence and the need population were trending downward before the pandemic. Uh, but you can see that uh, both of them significantly increased in the middle of uh, 2020 at the height of the uh, pandemic-related lockdowns. Uh, but since 2020, we see that the, the, the need population and the need incidents have been trending downward again. You can see, you can probably see in the graph that there's a huge drop in the need population in July 2020 which is very puzzling because uh, the conditions at the time would not, could not have supported such a big decline in the need population. So we do not uh, put too much weight on that uh, data point. Next slide. Okay, so in this slide, we show the need incidence or the prevalence of being need among uh, different subgroups of the youth. So geographically, out of the country's 17 regions, BARM has the highest need incidence at 27%. And it's followed by the Dava region and Mimaropa at 20%. And Zambanga Peninsula and Central Luzon at 19%. Uh, in terms of sex, females are more likely to be need. So 24% uh, of the female youth are need. Compared to just compared to just fourteen percent among among male youth, and that uh, rate is even higher among females aged twenty to twenty four. The need the need incidence among them is forty percent, and it's even higher among uh, young married females. So among young married females, the need incidence is sixty seven percent. In terms of urbanization, need incidence in rural, area, rural areas and urban areas are roughly the same. So it's 19% in rural areas and 18% in urban areas. And in terms of family income, uh, need incidence is generally higher among youth who belong to lower income or poorer families. So 23% of the youth in the bottom half of the income distribution are need 
compared to just 11% among the youth who belong to the top 20% of families. Next slide. So here we show uh, the composition or the profile of Filipino youth in terms of different characteristics. So in terms of age, the overwhelming majority of meat are aged 20 to 24, 69%. And also, the large majority of them are female. So 63% or nearly two-thirds of the Filipino meat are female. Uh, in terms of education, 43% have a lower secondary education. And uh, just over half of them, half, over half of the meat, 56%, uh, live in rural areas. And finally, in terms of income, 56% uh, of the need come from the poorest, 40% of families in terms of income. Next slide. All right, so when we look at the economic status of the need, we see that most of them are actually economically inactive or out of the labor force. So we find that 74% uh, of the need are inactive or are not participating in the labor force. And uh, actually 52% or over half of the need population consists of females who are economically inactive. And then uh, among the econo economically inactive need, uh, we find that the main reason for being out of the labor force or economically inactive is home care. So 45% say that 45% of the economically inactive say that the reason for their inactivity is home care or family duties. And then finally, we find that over 60% of female need who are economically inactive are married. So this seems to say that uh, marriage and family formation have a lot to do with why female need um, are not participating in the labor force. Next slide. So next we discuss the barriers that keep need, uh, keep the Filipino need from pursuing to get. Next slide. So we answer this question by means of an online survey. Uh, so the target respondents of this survey were current trainees and applicants in TESDA Technology Institutes or TTIs and current trainees and applicants in YouthWorks PH, the PPED and USAID program. Um, so in terms of eligibility, anyone among these respondents or target respondents were eligible for the survey or to take the survey as long as they were neat at the time of their application to their respective programs. So uh, the way we collected our responses was uh, we asked TESDA and YouthWorks to, to advertise the survey and to promote it uh, among their constituents. And we asked them to collect as many respondents as they can. So our survey is self-selected, meaning anyone who was uh, who was willing to participate in it could uh, answer the survey as long as they were eligible. And this means that uh, we have a non-random and non-probability sampling method and our sample is not representative of the need population or even the need population of, of TTIs and the Youth Works program. So this means that um, that's one of the limitations of this uh, uh, methodology is that uh, findings from this online survey are not generalizable, but uh, even so, we think that um, the results that we got are informative. So uh, we conducted our survey in March 2021, and uh, um, the usable sample size that we achieved is uh, 1,688. And most of them, 61%, were trainees in TESDA Technology Institutes. Next slide. All right, so 
we ask the respondents to name factors that kept them from pursuing Tibet uh, before they applied for uh, the training program. So, and then we allowed them to name more than more than one factor. So these are the top responses. So the top reason is uh, financial. So 48% said that the reason why they didn't pursue Tibet before was that uh, they lacked funds for tuition or allowance. And that is followed by the lack of information at 13%. Uh, household or caring duties at 11% and working or seeking work at 10%. And then 36% uh, said that they didn't experience any hindrance. Next slide. So we also asked our respondents about what they thought were the types of, su of support that uh, youth need in order to encourage them to pursue Tibet. And uh, these are the top responses that I gave. So two of the top five uh, responses were financial in nature. So 58%, which is the top response, said allowance support. And then 48% said vision support. That is the third highest response. And then the two other of the top five were uh, about information. So 56% mentioned information about jobs. And then 39% uh, said uh, information on Tibet programs. And then the last one is uh, job search support or uh, assistance in looking for employment at 47%. Next slide. So, uh, next slide. So, what did we learn from uh, from our study? So, in terms of the profile of the need, so we saw that uh, need incidence is highest in Barm, and it's followed by Davao region, Mimaropa, uh, Zamboanga Peninsula, and Central Luzon. We also found that uh, need are mostly female and they tend to come from poor families. And NEET are also mostly economically inactive. And the primary reason for inactivity being uh, home care and family duties. Next slide. So in terms of the barriers uh, to pursuing Tibet, uh, we found through our online survey that uh, financial constraints were the main barrier. Uh, that hindered them from uh, from pursuing Tibet. And this was followed by the lack of information and housework. And then uh, through the survey, we also found that financial support, uh, meaning tuition and allowance support, and information on jobs and Tibet programs can help uh, encourage training participation among the youth. So again, uh, Although our survey findings are not generalizable, they are nonetheless still uh, useful. So next slide. So in terms of our recommendations, the first one is to conduct more in-depth studies on the determinants of being neat, including the high level of inactivity among female neat, in order to identify policies to draw them into training or employment. And then finally, uh, to encourage Tibet participation among NEET through financial support, information dissemination, and uh, employment facilitation assistance. Okay, so that is all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, JP. So uh, we are down to our last uh, presentation in this time. Uh, we will hear about a useful tool that can help students and learners make informed choices about their career and study, make informed decisions about their career and study choices. And we have Ms. Uh, Yolanda Castillo de las Alas, Senior Specialist at the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, Regional Center for Educational Innovation and Technology, also known as CIMEO Inutech. 
Ms. De Las Aulas has been with Inutech since 2004, guiding the implementation of research and development projects such as academic and career preparation of learners, digital technology and innovation, alternative learning modalities and capacity building of school communities, including dissemination and technology transfer of successful innovations. She has a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering, master's degree in professional studies, and has PhD units in organizational development. Ms. Delas Alas cannot join us today. Uh, he, she cannot join us live today due to a health emergency, but being a true professional, she recorded her presentation from the hospital. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yoli. And Thea, you may now play her presentation. Good morning. Thank you, PIDS, for inviting Inotech to share with you about the as our contribution in preparing the youth for a productive, resilient, and career-ready future. In support of the DepEd Career Guidance Program for high school students, Inotech developed the MCDP Toolkit in 2017. It was designed to guide secondary level students in choosing careers that they intend to pursue to become productive members of society. This includes planning for and determining the students' track and strand for senior high school, choosing their curriculum exits, and planning for their future. Inutech, or the Regional Center for Educational Innovation and Technology, is one of the three CIMEO centers hosted by the Philippine government. CIMEO, or the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, is an umbrella of 11 ministries of education in Southeast Asia. It has 26 specialist institutions spread in 10 countries that focus on research and training programs in education, science, and culture. Since 1970, Inotech provides quality learning services, research and solutions development, knowledge management, and other enabling support services to effectively respond to educational needs in Southeast Asia. Part one of my presentation is about the MCDP journey, which includes the rationale, an overview, the development process, the toolkit features and components, and sample planning activities and tools. The second part will dwell on how Inotech took the MCDP toolkit to greater heights by developing derivative knowledge products for education ministries such as explainer videos on MCDP and senior high school trap and strands and the adaptation of MCDP in Lao PDR. For the, for the part one, MCDP uh, is in a text intervention to support the Philippine K-12 program particularly the institutionalization of senior high school, which broadened the goals of secondary education. Section 17 of Basic Education Act states that the senior high school program aims to properly guide the students towards becoming productive and contributing individuals through informed career choices and to develop the capability of career counselors and advocates to guide and equip the students with necessary life skills and values. Acknowledging that there are not enough licensed guidance counselors in public schools, Inotech assisted DepEd in developing resources for teachers serving as career advocates to guide students in making sound and informed career choices as they register for senior high school. The toolkit provides teachers and career guidance advocates with basic tools and techniques in career coaching. It contains planning activities and assessment tools to help learners gather information about themselves, the labor market, educational institutions, and people around them to make informed choices about possible career pathways also to identify senior high school track and strands, explore various career pathways and study plans 
to achieve their life goals. The toolkit is primarily used by teachers and learners, but also accessible to school heads and parents. How was the MCDP toolkit developed? In 2016, the concept was presented to DepEd through the Youth Formation Division of the Bureau of Learning Support Services. After which consultations on MCDP were held with career guidance counselors from the academe, from Career Development Association of the Philippines, Philippine Guidance Counseling Association, technical experts from DepEd, Testa, Dole, PRC, and Education.ph. There's also focus group discussions with teachers, learners, parents, and school head from San Pedro Relocation Center National High School. And the FGD revealed that career guidance task is an additional load for teachers, and they should be equipped before undertaking this crucial task and should find time to conduct the sessions. Teachers need a simple and easy to use resource material on career guidance. Schools should provide required materials for career guidance sessions. And in Philippine setting, family is one of the major deciding factors in choosing a career. Using a career portfolio will help students in making good career decisions. So based on this information, Inotech drafted the MCDP tools and session guides. We top experts to review the toolkit following the principles of developmental guidance and counseling. And lastly, we pilot tested the toolkit. During pilot testing at San Pedro Relocation Center, National High School and Raja, Suleiman Science and Technology High School, a survey with teachers and learners and FGDs with teachers, learners, parents, and school heads were conducted to evaluate the toolkit based on clarity of instruction, appropriateness to career planning, ease of use and reproduction, content organization and structure, and usefulness in choosing a senior high school track and strand. Respondents validated that the toolkit is a valuable tool for students' career decision-making. Majority of teachers and students agreed on the effectiveness of the MCDP toolkit. They liked that the toolkit is easy to read and use. Overall recommendation was to use the toolkit as a supplemental resource for career guidance. The toolkit can be described as a simple and concise material. It can be used out of sequence or on-demand basis. The teacher can start in any activity that are applicable to the level of abilities of students. It highlights that career planning is an iterative or continuing process, which can be repeated in other planning stage or grade levels. The toolkit is also easy to reproduce. It empowers teachers to develop their own session guides and identify their own strategies in using the toolkit. For example, activities can be delivered either in two or three sessions, four or five, depending on teacher's assessment of students' level of readiness. The toolkit has a summary guide for career advocates, specific instructions for activity called activity guides. There are a set of activities and tools and sample session guides developed by teachers. Component one contains the assessment tools that the students can use to achieve the desired outcomes. In this matrix, for each learning outcome, there are recommended tools that career advocates may use. For example, for objective one, which aims to demonstrate students' awareness on career planning and pathways, the teacher may use tools number one, two, and 10. This matrix guides the teachers in planning and facilitating the CGP activities with their students. The toolkit starts with an introductory activity followed by four main activities. The uh, introduction focuses on visioning, identifying goals that give the students a sense of direction in life. 
activity one guides the students to discover and rediscover who they are and to better understand their interests, talents, and values. Activity two guides students in identifying possible senior high school tracks and related career options based on their interests, talents, and values. Activity three dwells on factors to consider in choosing a career, such as actual skills requirements for a certain career. Students will respond to questions like, do I have skills necessary for my chosen career? What skills do I need to develop or improve on? Can my family afford to send me to school? Or, and can my family afford the course I wanted, I wanted to take? Activity four is about putting all the pieces of information together and coming up with a career portfolio and prospective career options, beginning with the preferred senior high school track. Other tools include the career wheel, my family and my, my career choices and career pathways portfolio, which have been useful to the teachers, learners, and parents during the tryout. As applied in the Federal Relocation Center National High School, they use the MCDP toolkit in pure and hybrid approach. Some teachers use the MCDP toolkit in the pure sense, while others integrated the activities and tools lifted from the MCDP toolkit and the DepEd Career Guidance Manual for grade 10. Tool number five, or career wheel, was used to examine career destinations per career track or strand. Tool number six, uh, about my family and my career choices. This was used for goal setting and grounding with, with the participation of parents or guardians, because culturally speaking, they are important stakeholders in their children's career decision making. Tool number 10 or the career pathways portfolio and tool number 13 or the MCDP map were used to connect the dots between education and career pathways. In here, students will chart or navigate their own course. In exploring career pathways, students will use the career interest clusters and the career wheel. Career clusters are group of jobs that have similar skills, tasks, or characteristics. Students will be asked to choose a career cluster that best describes their inclinations, interests, and abilities by shading the statements listed under each cluster that applies to them. Based on their interests, students will discover the career cluster that applies to them. In this example, the cluster with the greatest number of shaded statements corresponds to cluster B or the sports track. This means that the student has the aptitude for sports. Another option is to choose cluster D or the accountancy, business, and management. The career wheel contains the career pathways for each senior high school track and strand. These will guide students in choosing a senior high school track that leads them to a future career. There are two ways of using the career wheel. One way is to look at the outer circle for a prospective career choice and then trace its corresponding senior high school track and strand. For example, if the student is interested in becoming an engineer, one option is to take the academic track, particularly the STEM strand. Another way is to focus on the, on the track or strand, which is located in the second or third circle, that students are most inclined to and and then they will trace what career options are available after senior high school or college. Right? For example, if a student is inclined to take up arts and design, he or she may work as a draftsman or illustrator after senior high school or create his own business. Upon completing college, he can become an architect or interior designer. This activity called My Family and My Career Choice is used for goal setting and grounding activity. This requires the participation of parents or guardians to determine if their dream career or expectations for their children would match with the personal choice of their children and vice versa. 
In this activity, a dialogue between the parent and the child is encouraged to discuss what they have discovered, share their reflections, arrive at an agreement, and discuss parental support in case a career has been decided upon. The main activity has a corresponding activity guide. Here is a sample activity on connecting the dots between education and career pathways. As an integration, students are expected to develop their own career pathways, portfolio, and career, career study planner. They must put all the pieces of information together by completing assessment tools number 10, 11, 12, 13 to 14, so they can identify career options beginning with the preferred senior high school track. In the annex section, sample session guides on career planning are presented. Teachers can use this as reference in modifying or developing new session guides. They could use the MCDP toolkit as a supplementary career guidance resource for grade 10 during the COVID-19 to support the learning continuity plan. In 2019, DEPID also requested InnoTech to develop an unexplainable video to better guide teachers and career advocates in using the toolkit. In 2020, InnoTech repackaged the toolkit into a six-part explainer video series featuring the toolkit activities plus an introductory video the videos were validated in December 2020 by teachers and guidance counselors from San Pedro Relocation Center National High School as an effective complementary material to the existing printed version and DepEd's career guidance modules and is useful for career orientation and planning, not only for teachers as career advocates, but also for students. The video was turned over to DepEd on February 2021 and now available on Inotech's YouTube and DepEd's Learning Resource Portal. Inotech also developed an explainer video on senior high school tracks and strands. As DepEd puts it, learning resources in video format have been effective in reaching out to more learners, especially during challenging times when face-to-face -face classes is not allowed. The video features the four senior high school tracks, the academic tech, Walk, livelihood, arts and design, and sports track. It supported the cascading of senior high school in programming schools through distance learning. The video provides a clear picture of what each track and strand is about and helps grade, grade 10 students decide which path to take to achieve their career goals. In June 2021, TEPED rolled out its pilot version to regional offices and widely disseminated to teachers for immediate use during career orientations. Later, InnoTech conducted a user feedback a rapid assessment from July to September 2021. Respondents recommended the video as a medium to inform grade 10 learners and their parents about senior high school track and strands and as a supplementary resource to help learners plan for their career tracks, choose their curriculum exits, and plan for their future. In August 2021, uh, the DepEd Memo on Career Guidance Program for school year 2021 to 2022 has included the MCDP Toolkit and Video Senior High School Tracks and Strands as supplementary resource materials for grade 10. Inotech also shared the MCDP Resource Kit to LAPDR Education Ministry to support the ongoing career guidance modeling in secondary schools, which is being implemented through the Education for Employment Sector Development Program, funded by Asian Development Bank, or ADB, from April 2021 to June 2022. This is how the MCDP resources were adopted by Lao PDR. In 2020, NUTEC identified which CMU member country may be interested to use the MCDP toolkit. Inotech had authorized the Law Education Ministry to adopt and customize the toolkit to support ADB's career guidance program for 20 districts and 60 schools. The toolkit was translated to Law language for piloting and project schools in eight provinces. Considering the challenges during pandemic, EEESDP conducted a series of adaptation workshops between February to March 2022 through face-to-face -face training 
with online technical support from Inotech. And through a ministry decree dated uh, April 2022, the Director for General Education in LPDR has approved the toolkit for pilot utilization in eight secondary schools. The ministry may adopt the resources for as long as they acknowledge Inotech as the source of the material that is for non-commercial use and share alike use of the resources. Lastly, in June 2022, a training of trainers was conducted. Inotech supported the career guidance program of DEPET and Law PDR to guide students in choosing careers tracks that they intend to pursue to become productive and contributing members of the society through informed choices. We believe that this sets as a strong anchor in preparing the youth for a productive, resilient, and career-ready future. At this time, MCDP users had expanded from debit career advocates to learners, parents, school heads, and now to now secondary school teachers. And this is through the derivative knowledge products developed through the years in response to the needs of education ministries. This has been the journey of the MCDP toolkit thus far. For more information, you may download and share copies of the toolkit and videos on using the MCDP toolkit and videos on senior high school track and strands at the Inotech's website and YouTube channel. These are also available from DepEd's learning resource portal. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Yoli, for your comprehensive presentation about the MCDP toolkit, which is uh, undoubtedly is a very useful resource that our teachers, career counselors, and learners can use. We will pray for your son's healing and your safety as well. So, friends, we have come to the next part of our virtual forum which is uh, the Q&A. But before I start uh, reading the questions, I would like to inform you that we will randomly select three um, names from Zoom and each of them will receive a prize. So I will announce the winners of our raffle before uh, we close the webinar. While I am checking the questions in our Q&A box, may I request our resource persons to, to turn on your uh, videos or our our audience can see you as you answer the questions. Now, Ms. Yoli de las Alas will be uh, represented by her colleague, Ms. Eni Yanga Domingo, Senior Associate at Simio Inotech. Okay, so let me now check our uh, chat box. And uh, okay, most of um, the questions actually have been answered by our uh, speakers. But uh, I may uh, refer again to some of the questions, although they have been answered already, so that uh, our uh, uh, resource uh, persons can can again uh, give their answers for the benefit of those who are watching us on on Facebook Live who have no access to the to the, to our Q and A box. So let me start uh, with a question from our uh, about our last presentation. Okay, and this is directed to Ms. Annie, who's representing Ms. Yoli. Okay, is the MCDP toolkit? Well, this question is from uh, Consul General Maria Lourdes, uh, Maria Lourdes Salcedo, who is watching us from Melbourne. Is the MCDP toolkit digital based? What platforms is it delivered? If there is shortage of guidance career counselors in schools, can a system be developed? for online counseling uh, similar to telemedicine once the learner finished the basic assessment. Okay, Ms. Emmy, please. Hi, um, Ms. Hul, General, thank you for that uh, question. Yes, the MCDP toolkit is actually available in printed copies and also PDF format. It's available on Simio Inotech's website and also for our colleagues from the DepEd. It's also downloadable um, from the DepEd's LRMDS. Um, with regard to the question on upscaling it um, through online counseling, no? um, Simio Inotech is, um, in fact, <laughs> exploring this um, concept. And um, we feel that, yeah, it's about time to also venture on such new platforms, no? such as online or web-based applications, perhaps. and yeah, we hope to be able to perhaps update <clears throat> the content of the toolkit and make the content available 
in um, other digital platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Emmy. Okay, there is a question here for Dr. Magno, which he already answered, but I think this is uh, very interesting. So this one is from Cedric James Pulga. How should the national or our government uh, intervene to our, uh, with our indigenous communities to ensure that civic education are well integrated in non-formal educational institutions? Uh, Dr. Kiko, please. Okay, yeah, thank you, Cedric, for that uh, very uh, good question. Uh, I think Cedric is from Palawan, so we know that many of our indigenous communities are, well, all over the country. But uh, in my answer, I actually uh, emphasize that maybe the non-indigenous uh, people, like we, we in Manila, and our kids should learn more about what's What's uh, what are the practices uh, in the indigenous communities? So it works both ways. Mm -hmm. So I think Cedric's question is, how can civic education uh, be integrated in the education programs of indigenous communities? So uh, I think it should be both ways. Uh, 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 because our project is, is currently reviewing the current civic education programs uh, k-12 as well as ngos so that that portion ngos would be the non-formal so i i am uh, proposing uh, and this has to be vetted still because the the, the uh, youth-led program is, is just in its first year so it's in a five-year program so so far i i'm uh, thinking that uh, ngo programs ngo education programs should actually uh be be uh i think be uh available for uh the uh, basic education sector and and that i think is a point of convergence and on the other hand i mentioned in my presentation that the ngos uh can act actually we invited them during our data validation activity and they appreciated that they need to structure better their, mm -hmm. their education training programs. And I myself have been doing uh, training programs. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of the uh, post, uh, uh, how do you call it? Adult learning, right? Adult mm -hmm. learning programs. But interestingly, many adult learning programs are now being uh, integrated in, the, in uh, senior high school, junior high school through the transformative learning methodology. So instead of uh, maybe, uh, I think Sheila already went through K to twelve, but uh, uh, of course, uh, in the older days, it's a uh, a talk and chalk approach, talk and chalk. Pero may wala ng chalk no, uh, Zoom approach. So nakikinig lang yung mga bata, and then the teacher actually uh, provides all the information, no. And I remember as a kid, I I I like that. I like memorizing uh, dates, names. Uh, so I won. Uh, I I joined contests, and we had the uh, material then called Junior Citizen. But we just memorized. But nowadays, they have all sorts of uh, uh, tools, technologies like uh, simulation. They do a lot of group group activities, mm -hmm. team, team activities, so not just in, as individuals. So yeah, that's my long answer to that a very nice question. So let's uh, put more content, uh, indigenous mm -hmm. people's content. Uh, and finally, uh, let me just share what I learned when I did my dissertation. I went to the mountains. I went uh, to an indigenous community, and I learned that they're teaching uh, environmental conservation in in that uh, mountain high school so uh, they, they they actually show a video of uh, what's happening in brazil so maybe uh we can have video materials that we can show to our kids in the cities of uh indigenous people's community practices because they they do have uh, uh indigenous decision making systems uh they have council of elders, so they know how to build consensus. So they, they might disagree, but at the end of the day, 
they have this traditional uh, community-based decision-making system. And consensus building is being lost, I think, along the way in this uh, digital world. People are bashing each other just by suggesting something new. But that is not the way of democracy. So maybe we can uh, we can learn, um, and the adults, I probably should learn how to how to uh, exchange ideas, uh, because uh, perhaps uh, social media technology, the algorithm, and and there's commerce there. The more you bash, the the more mm -hmm. you create traffic. You, there's volume, but there's also disinformation and misinformation. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very <laughs> much, Dr. Tito, for those very uh, important points. Okay, let's move to another question. This has been answered already uh, by our speaker, but let me uh, read the question because it's very interesting, very important. And this one is from uh, uh, Mr. Sonny uh, Pashona from Cedric James Pulga. Did your study also include local government support to... Uh, uh, the youth organizations that you mentioned, the 4-H clubs, how are the barangays or the higher LGUs record? Okay, how do barangays or the uh, or the higher LGUs recognize or uh, support their endeavors? This question is actually related to a uh, to a comment shared by a uh, consul. Uh, Consul General uh, Maria Lourdes uh, Salceda. She said that. Um, Okay, 4-H clubs uh, contributing to youth development, particularly in getting them involved in agriculture. And she mentioned that uh, in uh, Victoria, Australia, uh, she has been looking at community gardening as a possible model to address hunger in rural Philippines. And uh, perhaps the 4-H club could be an avenue. Asani, please go ahead. Thank you for uh, the question, Cedric, and for uh, reiterating that, uh, Ma'am Sheila. Um, based on my response to um, Cedric, actually, yes, definitely uh, local government units, uh, they have very critical roles in terms of um, uh, supporting these young people, specifically on their projects. So their support, uh, support from the local government units, uh, it comes in uh, various forms. So it could, uh, at the barangay level, for instance, it could be, uh, uh, sila ng lupa dito sa tapat ng barangay hall for these young people. So they can utilize that where they can build their gardens. Uh, at the municipal level, they can uh, write letters to um, the mayor, uh, soliciting support uh, for gardening tools, for instance. And actually, some of the government agencies, uh, for some, they are already providing that. But for other resources that these young people need for their projects, um, these local government units uh, from, the, uh, from the local level, municipal, provincial, and regional levels, they uh, do provide support to these young people. And uh, it actually comes in two ways. Um, it helps uh, uh, that uh, mom... Who is that? Mom Lourdes has mentioned that um, it's 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 a very uh, uh, great example or model for youth engagement in agriculture because uh, we've also noted here that um, it comes in two ways. One is the enhancing the visibility of young people that they are actively engaged in their communities. When local governments or local officials are able to see that that these young people are doing something meaningful for their community. Uh, some of them, the mga harvest nila from their uh, communal gardens uh, at the height of the pandemic, ginamit nila yun for the community pantry. So instead of generating income for the club, they use it for the community service. Um, once the local government units are supportive, uh, young people, the 4-H youth are appreciative of that. And there are also chances that uh, the local governments will also tap into their resources. For instance, uh, there are cleanup drives or tree planting activities and other civic activities uh, in the community. They are, they are also being uh, tapped by these local officials. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Sunny. Okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Uh, Yabut. It's, it's a very interesting study and it showed that between environmental knowledge and environmental attitude, the latter, I mean, attitude is a stronger predictor of conservation behavior. How do you think can we enhance or strengthen positive attitude change that can lead to positive behaviors towards uh, protecting the environment? And what role do you see can youth clubs 
uh, play to drive attitude change. And I'm referring not just to the 4-H clubs uh, presented by Mr. Pashon, but youth clubs, youth organizations in general, sir. Dr. Very Yabut? good question. Yeah. Very good question, Ms. Sheila. Uh, as I've mentioned a while ago, very important yung social factors, no? Specifically social norms, social roles. So if in the university or school, merong mga, the youth club, for example, may activities na which promotes uh, conservation behavior, or even the school setting, merong mga in-implement na rules, and nagkakaroon ng social norms, culture, that will greatly shape or affect or positively affect the attitude of people. Kaya nga sabi ko, chicken and the egg eh. Kasi attitudes personal and mm -hmm. yet malaki yung role ng environment also. So kahit na mag, uh, anong tawag doon, turo mo nang ituro, kung di naman mm -hmm. ginagawa, hindi nakikita. Kaya mahalaga yung nakikita sa, mm -hmm. at least sa school, no? Para mahubog yung attitude nila. Mm -hmm. Salamat. Salamat po, Dr. Homer. Okay, let's uh, move to a question for uh, our resource person from PIDS. Uh, and this one is from uh, Ma'am Lourdes uh, Salcedo. Home care, uh, JP, this is for you. Home care should be considered an economic activity. Can PIDS look into this matter so that our household workers, including overseas, will be better appreciated and respected? Can TVET be promoted in a better light in schools and our communities. Here in Australia, trade workers earn better than office workers. Uh, JP, uh, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so actually, um, one of our research fellows, Dr. Connie Dokoykoy, Dokoykoy has written a, I think a policy note about uh, valuing um, Care. Valuing unpaid work. Unpaid work. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we already have uh, a study on that. Mm -hmm. um, on your, your comment about um, promoting Tibet. Tibet. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that that's uh, that's actually one of uh, our findings in the in our the second paper in that we did for uh, Tesla and Tibet. So there we actually got to talk to a construction company that uh, had its own uh, training school. So they were training uh, youth to become, uh, they were training youth in construction-related NC2 courses so they can work as uh, construction employees after. So what they said was that even with the offer of free tuition to, to the youth, they had a hard time finding uh, takers. They had a hard time recruiting trainees because of the low reputation of of construction. Mm -hmm. So, one of the recommendations that in, in that study was uh, improving the image of not just uh, construction but of uh, Tibet in general, so that um, maybe the youth have an idea that uh, blue collar jobs can actually be can actually lead to a uh, a rewarding and a viable career. So, yeah. Thank you very much, JP. Okay, let's uh, entertain the question of Sherilyn Kasuga. How do we address health, uh, financial, and values formation for our out-of-school out of youth? Are there tips to incorporate uh, uh, these things in our training? Um, perhaps we can hear from uh, JP. May we hear from you first, then I'll call on uh, Dr. Uh, Magno for his thoughts. Since you have worked on, uh, but but the coverage of your study was more on uh, uh, Tibet, no? But would you have any uh, thoughts uh, regarding this question? I'm sorry, uh, what was the question? How do we address health, financial, and values formation for our out-of-school youth? Are there tips to incorporate those, uh, I mean, values formation on health and, uh, value, let's say, financial literacy in our training? Okay, I'll call you later on this. I'll I'll move to uh I'll go to Dr. Magno first. 
Dr. Magno, this can be part of the, uh, you know, this the uh, the programs that are being, you know, in the K to twelve curriculum and those offered also by by our uh, NGOs. Okay, so uh, I think this uh, belongs to the purview of uh, citizens being able to access mm -hmm. social and public services. So once you get out of school, the you're not anymore within the out ambit of uh, DepEd or maybe CHED. So are there alternative uh, educational platforms, knowledge platforms? So the 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 local government can be one. Uh, because uh, uh, a lot of uh, SKs are asking what what should they do? Uh, they're so used to sponsoring basketball tournaments, beauty contests, or fiestas. Uh, but under the new SK law, uh, they are supposed to do youth development plans. So maybe they can incorporate mm -hmm. plans really for out-of-school youth because since mm -hmm. there's, there's still youth, right? Uh, and then, of course, yung sa NEET program, yung sa national naman yan, no? mga national agencies. So uh, in civic education... Uh, it's very useful really for being productive. Huh? Uh, citizens have both rights and responsibility, rights and responsibilities as well as duties. Yung duties nila, di ba, vote. Well, it's also a right, no? But yung sa, sa right or responsibility becomes a duty, vote wisely. Yung mm -hmm. nakalagay na wisely. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are investments in being wise, right? In voting, that's so that's part of civic education. So uh, also part of that is uh, obeying traffic signs. Mm -hmm. so, ang pagkukulang, no? Ang, ang pag obey ng traffic signs, uh, nasa driver, nasa pedestrian, even yung traffic enforcers kung minsan, ano, no? nagkakamali sa pag-interpret nung ano. Uh, so, uh, yung traffic signs, traffic rules, part yan ng law. So, obedience to the law or obeying the law. And then, may responsibility rin, no? Kaya nga civic right, civic, uh, civic right, civic duty, yung payment of taxes. Kasi you, you have social services, public services, and then uh, you are asked to pay taxes. Now, it becomes a right you have to be able to access public services. So that requires knowledge, also attitude, no? Yung, and maybe skills because some of the information are now online and some mm -hmm. people don't know how to access online services. And that that, uh, that was very much apparent during the pandemic. So even as, as, as we are speaking, so uh, yung mga... A civic responsibilities like uh, registering your kids. So, kung minsan nga, ano eh, di ba, dumadami pa yung anak mo kahit yung mga bata nakakaanak na rin. No? Those who drop out of school, nag, nagiging ano sila, yung teenage pregnancy is very prevalent. No? Although that's also a problem uh, in our conversations with DepEd. That's a problem also of in-school youth, yung teenage pregnancy. And then, uh, bata ka nga, nagkaanak ka ngayon, i and then you want to break the cycle, no? Na, na yung mga uh, anak hindi rin nakakatapos dahil yung parents nila hindi nakatapos ng pag-aaral. Yung lolo-lola nila hindi rin nakatapos. So, kailangan ma-break yung ganung cycle. So, you need to register your kid. You need to have them vaccinated. You need, uh, you need to put them in school. And, and nowadays, you even have to tutor them dahil pandemic eh. So, malaki responsibilities, no? Okay, but, but uh, again, uh, ang, ang, uh, I, I would like to end this uh, comment by saying what we need are civic education partnerships. Mm -hmm. Ibig sabihin, pag nag-drop out ka sa school, may sasalo. Uh, pwede ka namang bumalik pa sa school, di ba? Kaya nag-set up na yung DepEd, di ba, nung alternative learning system, yung ALS. So you can still continue your education. But I think yung broader question, yung civic education portion, 
So paano ba maging mabuting mamamayan? Ito ba ay pagsunod lang, no? Pagsunod sa batas. Tama 'yon, no? That's a civic duty. Pero may civic rights din. Uh, kasi yung batas naman hindi permanent 'yan. Pwede siyang magano eh, no? Ma-amend, -ma no? Uh, kung mali yung practice or kung may gaps dun sa policy. So as a good citizen, you can also provide feedback to our elected uh, officials. Kasi combine, yung civic education in our democratic governance, dalawa yan eh. Representative, representative governance or representative democracy and direct democracy. As a name, nasanay tayo sa representative democracy kasi election, no? we elect candidates. But how about direct democracy? Whereas, gusto nyo ba itong policy na ito? Hindi natin alam. So kasi hindi natin masundan kung ano yung mga discussions. So participation is part of civic education. But to participate, uh, we have to be, go beyond tokenism. There are mechanisms and the local government, local development councils, but we need to participate well. We need to be able to, to uh, read the budget, read the plans. So we don't just eat the snacks served during the, the consultation, but We have to earn. We have to earn our snacks and maybe lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Magno. We are down to our last uh, two questions because uh, we have no more time uh, left. Uh, but with uh, um, with our speaker's permission, please allow us to uh, stretch our open forum uh, a bit to accommodate our, uh, the last two remaining questions. Okay, this one is from Kevin Nera. How would you assess the effectiveness of the various interventions from the MME, from an MME perspective presented here and what assumptions change as a result of the shifts presented by COVID and the current proposals for the upcoming opening of schools? So there were um, uh, several uh, resource persons who presented interventions like The one uh, discussed by Dr. Magno, um, the TVET uh, program discussed by uh, uh, doc, uh, by JP, and then the MCDP, and then the uh, youth uh, the youth clubs presented by Dr. Uh, Mr. Sonny Pashona. May we um, hear first the response of Mr. Sonny Pashona, and then we will go to the other speakers. Uh, Sonny, please. Brief answers, please. Sunny? Sorry, Ma'am Sheila, I wasn't listening. Oh, uh, can you yes, that? yes. Um, can you give us, you know, a, uh, uh, okay, assessing the effectiveness of the various interventions from, um, from an M&E perspective uh, of uh, the health clubs that you mentioned and what assumptions change as a result of the shifts presented by COVID? Actually, hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank you for that question. Actually, uh, the context of pandemic is also within uh, our study because in terms of sustainability of projects, um, it's yung mga 4-H clubs because of the pandemic on sustaining their projects because there has been a, a challenge for mobility. Uh, imagine uh, having these community-based projects led by young people. For those young people below 18 years old, there were times na the provincial government did not allow them to go out of their of their homes so uh that's already a challenge for them uh in terms of sustaining or uh, in terms of cultivating the crops diba? so kaya dito yung pumapasok yung essence ng role ng adults kasi if young people can't do it uh the adults in the community are there to uh to help to assist them uh to help them sustain their uh engagements Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Pashona. May we hear from, uh, okay, JP, um, in terms of the PIBET programs, what did you see? Yeah, perhaps not from this study, but from your other studies uh, assessing PIBET. Um, JP, are you still there? And what has been the in impact of COVID? Are you still there, JP? Okay, uh, let's hear first from Miss Emmy. Miss Emmy. 
Yes, yes. Hello. Um, yeah, as presented earlier by Ms. Belas Alas, no, uh, there was already an initial assessment no, that was conducted using pilot data um, of the MCDP toolkit. However, the results were mainly on the validation of the usability of the toolkit no, for, for okay. the teachers, the learners. Um, as also mentioned earlier, the, the MCDP toolkit has already been institutionalized by the Department of Education for um, two consecutive school years, including the school year that has uh, been affected by COVID-19, uh, school year 2020 to 2021. So um, this is already, this evalu uh, impact evaluation or impact assessment is uh, within the radar of Simio Inotech, and it's something that we wish to do in the near future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Emmy. And, uh... Dr. Tika, would you would you have a brief answer to this? I know your project is just uh, one year old, but uh, yeah. you may have some insights. Yeah, of course, the the problem was really getting through the schools because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, it's all online, uh, so the the first year is really research. So the uh, the challenge is really the connectivity because we covered also schools in the provinces, so we did a lot. Well, basically, we did the Zoom, Zoom meetings, Zoom interviews. So, yung mga nagda-drop ng calls kasi weak internet connectivity. Uh, this is the, we're entering our second year and our partner, uh, UP, UP Diliman, is doing the research on public schools. So, now they're doing it face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. So, they're going around the country because of the uh, the new health protocols na pwede na. But uh, when we were doing it, uh, a months ago, a few months ago, di pa pwede. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a key challenge. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, I think the schools are also getting used to it. Uh, instead of going to a secretary, di ba? Mm -hmm. Especially mga schools, no? Sa college, parang, ano na, medyo, you can go directly to the administrators. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, wala yung mga secretary na magpa-follow up, magsasagot, di ba? Mm -hmm. Phone calls pa nung araw, eh. Pero ngayon, uh, chat, Viber, and everything. So are uh, we adapted to the situation? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kiko Magno. And uh, JP, back to you. Uh, what did you see in your um, assessment of PDF programs? Uh, what impact uh, did the? Uh, what was the impact of COVID and uh, JP? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, so this is not actually related to the study I just presented, but. The other study that we did for mm -hmm. uh, TESTA and PBED uh, kind of touched on this. So one of the good practices that uh, we encountered was the one that was being done by the Youth Works program of PBED, which is that, uh, of course, during the pandemic, um, most of the train, all, all of the training schools were, were closed. So you can't really go to to um, to the training school to to attend their classes. So what they did was they um, loaned their students uh, tablets, mm -hmm. and they also gave them uh, money to um, uh, to top up their their uh, load, so they can uh, get mobile data, and uh, they can take their classes uh, through their tablets. So that's one of the one of the ways by which uh, some training programs coped with the uh, with the pandemic. Okay, thank you very much, uh, JP. That is actually our last question. So, just to cap our discussion, may I ask uh, our speakers from some brief uh, parting words if they have any. Let's start with Dr. Kiko, uh, Dr. Magno. Please, if you have any uh, brief parting words for our audience. Actually, I, I learned a lot from this panel just by listening to the other speakers and there, there is convergence. No? And, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, I, I was looking for respondents to our study from mm -hmm. uh, uh, youth clubs. No? Meron pa lang yung mga 4-H clubs no? sa mm -hmm. rural areas. And, uh, I can see a lot of convergence even yung out-of-school youth and we, we use a neat, uh, neat category so uh yeah thank you for all the questions and uh, we will incorporate that in our mm -hmm. the next iteration of this uh, mm -hmm. the presentation of the findings thank you 
Salamat, Dr. Kiko Magno. Um, and Mr. Uh, Sani Pashona, please, uh, would you have any uh, brief, uh, parting words for our audience? Thank you, Ms. Sheila, and um, thank you, PIDS, for uh, giving the opportunity to Sirka to share our study. Uh, perhaps um, to sum up uh, what I presented is, or in general insight from the presentations is that um, for young people to grow, so we think about young people as like um, parang halaman. So they need um, good soil. They need an environment. They need an, an enabling environment. So they need sunlight. They need um, these enabling policies, enabling uh, mechanisms for them to grow well. So for young people to grow well, to be productive and resilient in the future, uh, they need young people need all the resources that they they can get, the support that they need specifically for from the perspective of the adults. So it's important that. Uh, we go beyond tokenism as what Dr. Magno has said. So it's really more on inclusive um, participation of young people in the decision-making processes, regardless of which sector they're, 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 they're in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sunny. And now may we hear from Ms. Emmy Domingo of uh, CMU Initech. Ma'am, go ahead. Ms. Emmy, are you still there? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, again, thank you very much for... Uh inviting Inotech to share you know, this knowledge product on career planning. And I guess we just wanted to um, reiterate you know, and, and highlight through this presentation that um, our youth, our young people should view career planning and career development beyond just a linear approach, you know, but more of us as an iterative um, process and that it's something, it's not one stop, lang, um, that everything education learning should um, go before the work no but it's something that should be constructed no um, through learnings and work um, um, in a more lifelong learning approach throughout life yeah thank you thank you very much uh miss emmy of uh you know tech unfortunately dr homer had to leave uh, uh because of uh an equally important um appointment so at this point friends please join me in thanking all our speakers for the nuggets of wisdom okay sorry i i missed the call jp jp please apologies jp uh, yes uh, <laughs> sorry JP. for that uh, so thank you for uh, inviting us to present our paper. So I think um, the main takeaway is that for, for, from from our study is that um, the ages fifteen to twenty four being youth uh, is a critical point in in uh, a person's life, and this is where they um, accumulate their knowledge and skills, and they build the human capital so they can become productive adults. So. We should, uh, our society, our government should do its best to pursue strategies in order to keep uh, the youth in education and in training and employment. So that is all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, JP. And again, friends, please join me in thanking all our speakers uh, for the nuggets of wisdom that they have shared with us this afternoon for um, sharing their uh, knowledge, outputs, uh, and products and services. And also thank you to those who join in the discussion by sending your comments and questions. Let's show our appreciation through a, a, a virtual clap. And, we, and here are the winners of our uh, webinar raffle. Okay. So, uh, Jasmine Wahe, Cedric James Pulga, and Siti Subaida Murod Malang. Our webinar team will um, get in touch with you for the delivery of your of your prize. And before we have we finally close, we have some announcements. Okay, so you can access the presentations from the PIDS and SRP uh, websites. And also, please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also, we will also email you the link uh, to the survey, to the feedback survey after this event. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual seminars, okay? Also, please regularly visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of our events. Okay, and friends, uh, two weeks from now, we will be celebrating the Development Policy Research Month, or TPRM, which is led by PIDS. 
The DPRM is a nationwide event that started 20 years ago by virtue of Malacanang, uh, Proclamation 247, which underscores the importance of uh, policy research in nation building. And flash on the screen is the DPRM theme for this year, which is Close the Gap, Accelerate Post-Pandemic Recovery Through Social Justice. Okay, And... Um, in support of the DPRM, PIDS is currently organizing several events in September, and this include a virtual kickoff forum on September 1, the annual public policy conference webinar series on September 13, 15, 20, and 22, and the Mindanao Policy Research Forum. Stay informed about this uh, virtual uh, seminars and how you can join by visiting our Facebook page and the DPRM website at dprm.pids.gov.ph, which will go live next week. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community that join us today. So the names of those uh, organizations are flashed on the screen. This concludes our SERP knowledge sharing webinar. Please watch out for our succeeding virtual events featuring the knowledge products and services of our partner institutions. Thank you once again for joining us at Maraming Salamat Paul.